as co-chair with Jack Bryant, we started um, the caucus for the Global Health Council, and we purposely gave it that name, the Spirit of Alma-Ata 1978. The four core elements for us drawn from the Alma-Ata Declaration are equity, sustainability, the social determinants of health, and community empowerment. I have uh, experience in implementing uh, uh, the Alma-Ata um, proclamation and system and process for 15 years in Ghana, West Africa. And um, so I consider myself um, a second generation. <laughs> And what we're so pleased about this morning is we have the first generation uh, in the presence of Dr. Taylor and Dr. Bryant and maybe others in the room, so I don't want to exclude anyone else. And uh, as a medical mission sister, I have a couple of our publications around and Dr. Frances Webster was present in Alma-Ata and there's an interview with her uh, in one of those booklets, which I'm going to pull out and kind of showcase as well. But um, we're so pleased. This is our first official caucus meeting, and I officially open it. Uh, we, um, we're, we're, we're smiling a little bit about being in this room because in 2003, uh, which was the 25th anniversary, and the Global Health Council had its meeting here and there was nothing on the agenda at the Global Health Council International Meeting. There was nothing on the agenda that year to celebrate the 25th anniversary. And we were in this room with the launching of a wonderful book called Community-Based Health Care from Boston to Bangladesh. We were launching that book in this room. And there were about 30 of us, all members of the Global Health Council, and we said, something's wrong here. And it was at that meeting in 2003 that we said, the council should have the right for members to form caucuses and get into the issues of how to shape our own Global Health Council. And so that was our beginning steps, the first letter written to the council, and uh, working to get this operationalized. So uh, f on our behalf, uh, that means that I was, I was a co-chair, and Jack Bryant is our second co-chair. Uh, this morning, uh, Sarah Shannon from the Hesperian Foundation isn't able to be here this morning, but she will be here at the council. Um, uh, she was our communications, and Connie Gates from the Jamked International Foundation, uh, she has been definitely part of our support to get this working. So we, again, we want to welcome all of you. Uh, we will tell you more about that whole process as the morning unfolds. So at this time, I'd like to invite uh, Janet and Carl and uh, uh, Jack up here to our little, um, we tried to make it conversational. And uh, uh, we have uh, a great desire to uh, keep this uh, in the spirit of uh, coming to uh, understand and to delve back into those values. Uh, Carl and I have worked out a, a little plan. Uh, we're going to begin with some uh, reflections on our early days uh, leading up to Alma-Ata. And then we'll move from that to uh, review a document that came out of the 15th anniversary of Alma-Ata in Almaty, Kazakhstan. Almaty being the changed name of Alma-Ata. And uh, Carl and I were there together in 1993 at this 15th anniversary, and we have uh, a summary of what was discussed there. And we thought it would be interesting to uh, hear what the people in this field were saying 15 years after Almata, which is almost 15 years before this. So uh, there we are. But first, uh, personal reflections. Uh, Nancy and I were uh, living in Bangkok with our children, 
uh, and uh, working at Ramatipadi Hospital and Faculty of Medicine, and had been home on uh, uh, holiday, and were headed back to Bangkok when I got a call from Philip, Philip Potter. Philip Potter was the executive director of the uh, World Council of Churches, and said they were having a problem in the, with the newly independent countries that th those countries were facing, and would I be willing to meet with him? And so, yes, we can do it. And so we decided to meet in Copenhagen as we proceeded from the U.S. to Bangkok. And we were joined there by John Karifa Smart, a, uh, a wonderful man from Sierra Leone who was uh, foreign minister and also minister of health and a number of other things. And so uh, uh, John Karifa Smart and I agreed to listen to Philip and see what we might say. And uh, so his problem was that with the uh, at this time in the late 60s, with the newly independent countries, uh, they were, a lot of the hospitals were being closed that had been run by the colonial countries. Uh, or those that were still open were understaffed and underfunded. And it was turning out to be a very serious matter for those countries. And he said, what should we do about it? And uh, John and I had a similar reaction. And we said, uh, Philip, we think you're asking the wrong question. Your question should not be, what do we do with the hospitals? The question what it should be, what do we do about the health of the population? And a lot of, the, of what is done must reach out to those people and not wait for them to come to a hospital, because many of them can't come. Uh, and so uh, that's not to neglect the hospitals, but that would just be a part of a larger approach. And uh, so Philip said, uh, well, 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 uh, so what do we do about that? And uh, we said, well, we feel that the World Council of Churches is entering a new era. And, uh, uh, but there are a number of the uh, churches, their missions, that are doing things actively in this area, that are working with communities and uh, bringing health uh, care and improving the health and well-being of those people. And uh, so you need a mechanism for uh, reaching out and uh, uh, finding out what's happening there and then bring it together, coale coalescence there, uh, uh, and uh, then plan and see what one can do to increase, improve what the churches are doing with a convergence of their interests. And uh, this is John and I both speaking about it. And uh, this then led to the founding of the Christian Medical Commission in the World Council of Churches, which was, by the way, about a third of a mile from the WHO headquarters. And uh, so it was formed. and. Uh, the uh, first director was Jim McGilvery, and one of the senior staff was Connie Gates, and I was the first chair. Carl was on the commission, and it went on from there for a number of years of uh, determining what was happening by the churches and their mission programs in various countries, and particularly uh, in the hands of local people. And uh, it was, there were some very exciting things happening. And the course of that, uh, Halston Mahler was the director general, and uh, we got to know him. And he was interested in what the CMC was doing, the Christian Medical Commission. And I remember one time I was talking to him in his office at WHO, and he said, you know, a bunch of our people were talking about health care and what's going to happen next. And he said, I said, you know, if you want to know what this health care for the community is about, walk down the street to the CMC. They know. They have experience. And uh, so then at one point that uh, in a most interesting and amusing situation, um, Mahler asked uh, Jim McGillivray and Nita Barrow, who was one of the senior staff, if they would come over and talk to some of his senior staff people. And so uh, the two of them came over and talked to uh, a group of around 15 senior WHO staff. And, uh, but Nita was very concerned. She said, you know, I, I'm not sure that this is a good thing to do. It reminds me of David and Goliath. And uh, Mahler then said, you know, I'm a parson's son. I know what David did to Goliath. <laughs> so with that, Carl. In those early days of working through the CMC activities, was the fact that um, people very quickly began to ask questions as to what we were doing. 
because the first thing we were doing apparently was to talk about the fact that the major effort and mission groups had been in hospitals and we were now very deliberately talking about moving in t to the community. And the way in which this kind of discussion evolved immediately began to polarize situations. There's something about primary health care that results in polarizations, and we had that from the beginning. People were very defensive about the Mission Hospital. And then they had two conferences in Tübingen in Germany to begin to talk about the basis for this being part of a mission activity. And those were very critical in terms of trying to get the approval of the general mission leadership in the World Council of Churches. We moved from that then to the formal setting up of the Christian Medical Commission as part of staff within the World Council. And those meetings then occurred every year and we began to define some of the principles of what we now know as community-based primary health care. And they put out, I think you were part of the contact staff, weren't you? Because that turned out to be a very important way of bringing the new ideas. And I can remember going into ministries of health around the world during those years. And they all said, this is the most useful publication we see because it had such a real life experience from the various projects around the world. Haftan Mahler had been a friend of mine from working together in India. And so he used to insist that I stop off in Geneva and talk with him when I was going back and forth to other places. And I began to tell him also about what we were doing in um, the CMC. And the thing that intrigued me was that from that first meeting with McGilvery and Nita Barrow, they then set up, I think it was a monthly lunch that he would have with World Health Organization staff just to talk about the concept. And it was very clear that the relationship then, as outlined by Sako Litsios in an American Journal of Public Health article just within the past year, showing this relationship as it developed from the perspective of people within WHO, was one of being st stimulated by the fact that it was already being done. Out of it, I then was asked by Hafdan to be one of two consultants to be responsible for the documentation that we were preparing for Alma Ata. And the writing of all those documents became a major activity during the, the three years up leading up to that period because we had a whole series of regional conferences and then that was all as part of building up the the awareness in the various regions of WHO of this becoming a very important conference. And when we then came together at Almata, one of the things we talked about was that this was a meeting of more ministers of public health than there had ever been to that time. Wasn't that right, Jim? That's my memory. And. Um, it really was a major bringing together of the best thinking around the world that then led to the kinds of things that we talk about now. And I think that um, one experience that um, I'd just like to mention, one of the things that impressed me most in listening to the speeches at Alma Ata was to realize where equity fits within the whole concept. Because when you heard people from the ministries who each had a few minutes to make their statement from their country, 
when they said the words health for all, there was a real difference that came out very clearly to me listening to the, to the speeches, which was when people from developing countries said the slogan, they said, health for all. When people from the developing countries said the word, they said, health for all. And the difference in emphasis was what led to the awareness of the importance of equity. Well, thank you very much, Carl, for your uh, thorough discussion of those interesting times. Uh, now we're going to shift over. I have here a copy of Primary Health Care and Health Care Reform 15 years after Alma-Ata. Meeting held in Almaty, that was Alma-Ata, Almaty, Kazakhstan, December 1993, under the sponsorship of WHO and UNICEF. And uh, it's just interesting to me who was there. Um, introduction, overview of primary health care before and after Alma-Ata, a person named Dr. Carl Taylor. And then global perspectives, uh, I'll just give the names now, Hiroshi Nakajima, Guido Bertolasso, again Carl Taylor, Andrew Kreese, Joe Asphal, uh, Lobimana Koso, uh, Utan Mukhtar Rafai, uh, Dr. Jazeri from Emro, and Dr. Ikrim Bered Dink, <laughs> and then Jack Bryant. And uh, so uh, we just thought it could be useful to take that point in time, 15 years after Alma-Ata, uh, to see what the perspectives were. And with Carl and myself there, we've uh, uh, gone through some of the summary material. And so what we have are some uh, statements here that we will read from the, uh, that document, that summary, just to give you a notion of what the thinking of these people was at that time. Um, so to begin, introduction. There is no doubting the importance of the conference at Alma-Ata, the principles and processes of change that followed. This was a great intellectual and moral leap forward. Yeah. What, we, what faces us now is not simply a continuation of the pattern set in 1978 and built upon since. Ours is a changing world different than 1978. While the principles from Alma-Ata are to be seen and in, as enduring, their interpretation and actualization are changing by the day. Prior to Alma-Ata, the baseline conditions were those of severe underdevelopment, with poverty, gross inequities, and widespread weaknesses in governmental capacities. Major deficiencies were in the lack of specific concerns for the social dimensions of health and health care, and in the managerial and technical steps required to ensure universal coverage and measurable impacts of health services. One of the reasons for the ready acceptance of Alma-Ata was that health care, quite simply, did not work well. So then we go on to some initial responses following Alma-Ata. Carl? Yeah, I think that um, <clears throat> we had a very uncertain period, and we got into confusion and um, the clarity of the message at Almata. We immediately ran into a series of challenges in the, particularly as we got into the 1980s. And as we began to face those challenges, it was evident that um, we were not going to have any easy time of implementing the principles that we had talked about. And the fact that things were different in the different parts of the world began to then change the way in which we were able to carry through with the way that, the, uh, that we had been hopeful at the time of Alma-Ata. I guess there was, in the way that we looked at it in alma we began to realize that there had been some changes in attitudes. 
And the strengthening of political will that we had recognized that would be necessary had not been achieved. We had sort of made a simplistic assumption that it would follow naturally. And as we began to look at what else was necessary in addition to political will, we began to identify that systems changes were necessary. And there was a whole range of improvements of primary health care that would be necessary. And this led then to a realization that these changes would be involved in, a, in the recognition of complexities so that the post Almata period brought a, um, a recognition that we needed to be a little more careful in the way that we had actually talked about the challenges that were inherent in the declaration. And then the issue of real commitment to social equity and health systems development would have to be faced. And so we actually came through with a, an awareness also of the importance of the economic recession that was going on in the early 1980s, which was having a tremendous influence on the need for having new funds as we began to do the new kind of activity. I want to say something about the select the primary care, the select key Right. He's reminding me that um, one of the things that I really do need to talk about is the fact that we then ran into another very important set of complexities, which was in 1980 80 to 84, there was a whole range of new thinking that took advantage of the interest in primary health care. And we had the Walsh and Warren paper in which they talked about selective primary health care. This created a whole new set of complexities as we began to look then at how we could actually begin to carry through with the original vision of comprehensive primary health care and also accommodate the fact that there was a whole group of our colleagues who were making a very strong case for selective primary health care and we need, needed to meet that challenge in a very systematic way and I'm afraid we didn't do a very good job in meeting the challenge. Um, I'd, I'd like to go back a tiny bit to what you were saying, Carl, about the economic uh, part of primary health care and uh, the recession and the difficulties that happened before the Alma-Ati meeting. Many of us here are from NGOs and from academia. Um, I myself have moved from talking so much about community empowerment when I talk about primary health care now to talking about the social determinants of health that really, to me, are so incredibly important right now. I mentioned that I coordinate a social justice office here in Washington, D.C., and so I'm involved in uh, all kinds of organizations against the World Bank for the reform of the World Bank and the IMF because of international debt. Uh, I'm involved very much in uh, negotiations around the World Trade Organization, things that uh, perhaps health professionals, when I went to school, we didn't learn all those things. But now it seems to me it's critical that health professionals who are interested in uh, furthering primary health care have to deal and know very extensively about the social determinants of health, which at this moment are economic and structural economic problems. Any comments here? Well, I will certainly agree with you about the importance of social determinants. Um, in a way, there were some who championed it early, but in terms of general uses and applications, it's uh, a relative newcomer, increasing 
over the recent years. And now, just uh, months ago, the Commission on Social Determinants of Health was formed by WHO and uh, is now uh, one of the more influential uh, activities of WHO and, uh, in, and influencing all of us, I think. Um, so I'll carry along here then. Um, I probably uh, put a roadblock no, no, in there, no, but, but I did no, want to bring up, that up. up. No, that's all right. <laughs> I think it's very important. Um, now we get to challenges and obstacles to implementing the principles of Alma-Ata. We're back to the al -Mahdi report. And there's a list of them. So let's just see how they fit in with what you, re what you think about where things were then and now. The economic recession was a major and persisting constraint. The process of economic adjustment was sometimes undertaken with deleterious effects on health. You know, World Bank and IMF and so on. And this is another expression of the debt death interaction. There were serious inequities with respect to health care, both between and within countries, and Carl will come back to this in a moment. Manpower was often out of balance, specialists over generalists, doctors over nurses, and with limited interest in paramedical personnel. This is, all of these are reflecting on where the various countries were who were there at Almaty with this discussion. The transition from communicable to non-communicable diseases was becoming evident, and we know how strongly that's moved, and would loom as one of the major challenges to health care reform. Communicable diseases persisting, of course, recrudescence emerging remain serious problems. There were often dichotomous and conflicting approaches between vertical and integrated programs, curative and preventive, tertiary and primary, high cost, low volume versus low cost, high volume of care. There were examples in the more developed countries of development gone wrong. This is in the developed countries of uh, uh, drug abuse, social violence, and homelessness. And then we had the triad of poverty, population growth, and environmental degradation, which persistently drew attention as representing possibly the greatest and most difficult transition the global community would have to reverse from poverty and population growth and environmental degradation to health for all. Carl? Yeah, I think that um, the best uh, document that I know of on this um, what Jim Grant used to call the descending spiral that the world was facing of poverty, population growth, and environmental damage was represented in one of Jim's uh, State of the World Children reports in which this was the main theme that they developed as a, as a way of beginning to focus on the fact that we that what we're talking about in health goes way beyond just health services. And we've got to begin to really face the fact that all of development is an integrated process. And I'd just like to go back to the point that we were making about the serious inequities. I think there's been a certain amount of feeling that this issue of equity has been something that we've uh, begun, begun to talk about, but it's always been a problem. And to me, the most important part of the equity issue is, yes, it's always been an impor important problem. And the equity, inequity, is something that we have had down through history. But the fact of the matter is that the inequities are getting worse as far as health is concerned. And to me, the most dramatic example of that has been to watch what's happened to China, which was the model for much of what we wrote as being possible in the Alma-Ata documents. The fact is that when, after, well, in 1984, Jim Grant appointed me as the UNICEF representative in China. And through the 1980s, I was there seeing the whole system that we had used for the model for primary health care in its most universalized form. This is the largest population in the world was doing equitable primary health care 
at the time of Alma Ata. By 1984, that was gone. They had taken the assumption that modern healthcare was what was going on in the US, and we had seen the whole system under the Barefoot Doctors totally wiped out. And being there for UNICEF in those years was a really fascinating challenge because we thought we were building a system in which we would keep the two systems going. And we were wrong because in the western half of China, we saw the whole progress in primary health care reversed. And it became a very dramatic example of the fact that this is a fragile development that we're talking about. It was amazing to see in China how rapidly the whole system was turned around. And it showed that we had to have much more than just the good idea and the good system. You had to have the commitment to keep it going. Thank you very much, Carl. And your experience in China is just amazing, which I know when the times we visited you there and as we learned from you. Um, now, we'll go ahead to, uh, with Almaty to some responses and initiatives. While the principles of Alma Ata provided crucial guidance, the emerging and evolving problems in each country required national agenda, each country having to respond in terms of its own problems and capacities. You just heard about one country. It has been this interaction between persisting and emerging problems on the one hand and growing national capacities on the other that has formed the real substance of the pursuit of health for all. Let me just throw in a comment here. I'm sure that as we're going through this with a 1993 perspective, you're also thinking, aha, uh -huh, but what happened in the late 90s? What happened in the early O's of uh, new things that came in that were not seen then, but have come in? And so later, we'll, I'm sure, come to that in our discussions. <clears throat> the strength, and now here are the, some examples of the uh, pursuit of health for all. The strengthening of district health systems became a critical focal point as countries learned how to mount PHC in the context of governmental systems. The idea of surveillance for equity emerged as a key concept for guiding the development and extension of health services, particularly toward underserved and deprived populations. The core components of PHC were expanded, reflecting a flexibility to move beyond the declaration to what was called for by the local reality. There were a variety of attempts to resolve the dichotomies mentioned above that had become competitive and conflictual. The special place of women in development was given increasing attention. New technologies supportive of primary health care and health for all appeared. New vaccines, oral rehydration therapy, advances in information systems, new pharmaceuticals, uh, and there uh, we might even say Gobi came into it and the emphasis on uh, vertical primary health care. Uh, let me just give an example that comes to my mind quickly of uh, new developments that weren't thought of then, and that's the Millennium Development Goals. A, a global program that we now have in which primary health care is recognized as an absolutely crucial factor. And this wasn't on the, uh, on the screen at that time. Hey, Carl, another stream of change? Yeah, there's another stream of change that can be seen in the development of a convergence of thinking and programmatic ideas that have really come to the fore within the period since our Almaty conference. And to me, the most important part of that has been the way international organizations, institutions, and relevant groups are now looking in a fresh way at what, is, what are the desirable characteristics of health and social development. And the fact that these characteristics do include equity, cost effectiveness, community participation, intersectoral action, and the whole issue of sustainability have all now been recognized that they need to be given new emphasis and understanding. 
They've grown largely out of the Alma top type of thinking. And they now are beginning to get some international consensus. And so one of the things that we are seeing now is that the pursuit of health for all is something that is spreading among the international organizations. The World Bank has groups who are dealing with com community-based primary health care. UNICEF, UNDP, WHO, and all the other international groups are beginning to take this seriously. I'd just like to mention something that um, we have as a further polarization that is going to be very difficult to try to cope with, and that is that in response to this awareness among many of the international agencies that there is something that we have not been doing, and maybe it is related to health for all. There's been the very interesting development in Lancet, where Horton, the editor, has issued an editorial calling for a second child survival revolution. And some of the people who are involved in thinking about what this might mean are taking a very polarized stance again. They're saying what you're talking about now is just repeating the same mistakes that had been made after the 19, or in the 1980s. And we need to be very careful in how we begin to carry through with the dialogue that is now beginning over this issue of a second child survival revolution that we have had posed now in a very, very strong statement that does not take into account these ideas of community empowerment that we're talking about. Uh, thank you again, Carl. Um, now we go on in this report to the concluding reflections. Visualize, if you will, a, a room like this with maybe 10 times as many people in 1993 in which they're saying what they want to be reported in this matter, what they think are the important issues. So I'm reading this directly in order to kind of give a sense of what they had in mind and on their, in their voices. Advances since Alma-Ata and even since Riga, the 10th anniversary of Almat was held in Riga, uh, in Latvia, uh, and uh, I was there and part of that with Hofton Mahler and remember it very well. But what they're saying is advances since Almat and even since Riga have changed the landscape of health and social development. Equity and health for all are now permanently embedded internationally in the health policies and programs. There appear to be an evolution of ideas, methods, experiences philosophical constructs and commitments that are converging in a collective support of equity and health for all. As a matter of general reflection, it can be said that the principles of Alma Ata persist, generally without change. What is changing are the problems to be addressed and the resources, methods, and social political milieu through which they will be addressed. And now they pick it up in an interesting way. The critical point is that the principles of Alma Ata by themselves are not the answer. They are essential guides for policy, formulation, system design, and management. Or to put it differently, the principles without a system to make them operational lose their effectiveness, while a system not founded on the principles can be without significant effect. That pairing is so important. What we see generally is the search for constructs in which the principles are expressed in healthcare systems that respond to the unique needs and requirements of each society. A further point of importance is the increasing emphasis on the interaction of health and other aspects of development, that health is not health services alone. Each strengthening the other, this dual process is fundamental to what might be called the health for all movement around the world 
the joining of the principles of Almata with healthcare systems that can make those principles operational, and the integration of such healthcare into the larger development context. In this way, Almata moves onward from its original separate identity. Its full meaning is expressed in its integration into the larger process of sustainable human development. Yes. I think I see Jean standing up there. I think she wants the audience to have a chance to uh, ask some questions. Uh, and I think as the program will go on through the morning, I think we will develop more of the issues that you talked about, the social developments of health, uh, determinants of health, the equity, what it means in today's world, in, in this world of such conflict, of such uh, massive inequity, and uh, with so many of the health system, health care, medical care systems being destroyed in so many countries. And so what does that mean for us? Is there a future? I'll be honest, I sit here listening to some of this, and it sounds so marvelous, uh, saying that all this is, uh, uh, you know, accepted. I mean, in my world, I don't find it so much accepted, to be very honest. And uh, I'm very curious. I hope during some of the discussions this morning we will find out how, it, how much it really is accepted. It, certainly here in the U.S., I, I would say, from my view, it is not, unfortunately. But anyway, there are pockets. And this whole this meeting here is a, is a wonderful thing. It is a sign of hope for the future. I was in uh, both in Bangladesh and uh, at the people, first part of the People's Health Movement, and then this summer, last summer, in Ecuador, at the second major meeting of the People's Health Movement. And you will find more about that, I think, during this meeting. And then there will be an exhibit at the, um, at the Global Health Council meeting. To uh, It's a new movement of people. At that meeting there, I remember in uh, Bangladesh, Hafsan Mahler said, it is really time for the people to be out in the streets. We have to move these issues forward. He was also there in Ecuador. It was just incredible. This, I mean, I found him an incredibly old man. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful to talk about these things and say there is a future. And to see all these people and these people's movements around the world that are taking up what perhaps the health professionals have left aside. To me, the key issue that has emerged as a result of all of the experience that we've had since Alma Ta is can be summed up in one point, which is the importance of community empowerment. So much of what we've done has not been f focused on the issue of getting the community to have ownership. And I do have a few copies of the book that my son Dan and I wrote a couple of years ago called Just and Lasting Change, When Communities Own Their Futures. And for those of you who haven't seen it, I think it's at the desk here that you can take a look at that effort to bring the focus into the community empowerment, which I'm increasingly impressed with, with the importance in making what we've been talking about happen when you pay attention to what the community says and wants to do. Thank you, Carl. Um, I'll just make one quick comment about uh, some new developments that uh, were not foreseen in 78 or 93 or perhaps even 00. Um, I've been working with uh, Jeff and Sonia Sachs, uh, Jeff being the head of the Millennium Development Project. And it turned out that uh, they were, after his book, The End of Poverty, they were hunting for a set of villages to be the first site to show that the poor could be lifted out, could lift themselves out of poverty. And it turned out that that site was in a village called Sauri in western Kenya, which was 40 kilometers from the Tropical Institute where I've been doing my teaching. And so uh, I took a Boda Boda, which is a bicycle taxi, 10 minutes over to uh, uh, their headquarters in Kisumu. And uh, we were invited into that process. And I've come to, to have a, a detailed understanding of the process they're going through now with village 
uh, Millennium Village projects in 12 countries of Africa, uh, all with data emerging to show that these communities can lift themselves out of poverty if they have a bit of, if they have some support at the beginning and then have a substantial amount of community empowerment and development. But uh, that's for another discussion. Thank you. I think we have to move on, but I just want to, on behalf of all of us here, uh, thank these two gentlemen that, and I hope, Lou, that you have this all recorded for posterity on tape, because this is, uh, this is really a, tr a treasure to have heard from these two people who are so involved in the beginning of primary health care. So let's give them a round of applause and move on. <laughs>